Pastor Raphael, come on up and share with us. Welcome him, please. Praise God. Well, thank you very much for having me here this morning. It's great to be with you. And uh, great that you all will get up so early to listen to somebody. And uh, as you can tell from my accent, I wasn't born in this country. I was born in Cuba. Left Cuba 61 years ago. I was involved in the revolution in Cuba. I was in prison and tortured. But by the grace of God, that God that I did not know, but he knew me, I was able to leave Cuba legally on a student visa. Amen. And uh, went to the University of Texas. And after that, uh, I applied for political asylum. By that time, Castro was an open communist. So I was granted political asylum. And shortly after that, I applied for uh, my permanent residency and further on for citizenship. And I've been in this country now for 61 years. I love America with a passion. Like I love the Lord with a passion. And I want to, to, to talk to you about, about America. And about what the Bible has to say about our responsibility to this great country and to our Lord. And I'm going to do that both from a biblical standpoint and also from a historical standpoint. And I'm going to share with you some history that most Americans don't know because it's been erased from the history books. But you know something? I was just so upset when I heard for years, over the last eight, ten years, America is not exceptional. Nothing exceptional about America. Nothing could be further for the, from the truth. America is the most exceptional country on the face of the earth. Do you realize that America is the co only country in the world that was founded as a Christian country? When the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts, before they got off the boat, they penned a document called the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact begins by stating their purpose for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That was the purpose of America. It continues, we, in the presence of God, we covenant and combine ourselves together to form a civic body politic. In other words, some form of government. Why? For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. What are the ends aforesaid? The glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Now these were all committed Christians that came in that boat. You know, in the early 1600s, if you lived in England, and you were not a member of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, you were considered a heretic, and you were persecuted. That's what drove the pilgrims to America. They came fleeing religious persecution. But even these committed Christians, the first year they were at Plymouth Plantation, they decided to try a communist experiment. They said, look, we got all this land in front of us. Let us all work the land together. And let us share equally in what the land produces. Sounds very romantic, doesn't it? Well, that, that experience was a total failure. And it's easy to know why it was a total failure. Because maybe there's a guy over here that's very strong, and he can plow two, three acres of land a day. But there's another guy over here, very weak, that maybe he could plow a quarter of an acre. How long do you think that other guy over there was going to do two acres a day? After about a week, he said, I ain't doing any more than that guy over there. So nobody worked. They almost starved to death. As a matter of fact, half of them died that first year. But they were smart enough and flexible enough that at the end of that year, they came before Governor Bradford. And they said, Governor, this didn't work. So the governor said, all right. You take your own plot of land, 
You work the land, you feed your family. And the free enterprise system was born in America 400 years ago. Now the question is, if we tried it 400 years ago and it didn't work, why would we be dumb enough to try it again? You know, it doesn't make any sense. But yet, our universities are plagued with a bunch of Marxist professors that are spewing these this socialist ideas that have never worked. Have never worked. I'll tell you a couple of very quick examples that are happening right now. Venezuela used to be the richest country in Latin America. The only country in the Western Hemisphere that is a member of OPEC. People are starving to death in Venezuela today because of communism. Cuba, before Castro, Cuba was tied with Argentina for the highest standard of living in Latin America. Cuba had the eighth and ninth highest per capita income in the world in skilled and unskilled labor before Castro, higher than half of Europe. Today in Cuba, the average salary is $20 a month. Communism doesn't work. It's never worked. As a matter of fact, you look at the size of Russia. The economy of Texas is larger than the economy of Russia. The economy of California is larger than the economy of Russia. Communism has never worked. And yet, 40% of university kids today tell you, oh, socialism is a better system. It's never been. You come across others and say, well, Jesus was a socialist. Well, you must be reading a different Bible that I was reading. As a matter of fact, if there is one thing that the Bible teaches, it's free enterprise. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 19 there's a parable called the parable of the pounds. A pound was a unit of currency. And it says, this master went away and he gave each of his servants one pound. And he said, occupy till I come. In other words, be busy, do business until I come. He comes back after many days and he's asked the first servant, what did you do with my pound? Well, sir, I invested it, and I gained five other pounds. Well done, good and faithful servant. I will put you over five cities. Second servant, what did you do with my pound? Well, sir, I invested it, and I gained ten pounds. Well done, good and faithful servant. I will place you over ten cities. Now notice, twice the results, twice the recompense. That's free enterprise. You work twice as hard, you deserve to earn twice as much. Third servant, what did you do with my pound? Well, I know you're a hard guy, so I buried it. Here it is. And he said, you wicked and unfaithful servant. Take the pound away from him and give it to the one who has ten. And even the disciples didn't get it. The disciples said to Jesus, but sir, he already has 10. Let me ask you two questions. One, why did he take the pound away from the one who only had one? Because he was an unfaithful steward. We have a stewardship of everything you got. You know, you may hear churches that tell you the tithe is the Lord's. That's a lie. A hundred percent is the Lord's. It's all his. And we are only stewards, not only of our money, we're stewards of our children, we're stewards of our family, Amen. we're stewards of everything. So the one who had one was the lousiest steward, so he doesn't even deserve to have one. Why did he give it to the one who had ten? Because he was the most faithful steward. The Christian life is all about stewardship. It's all about stewardship. And let me tell you something, each and every one of us are stewards of this great country that God has given us. And too many of us have failed in our stewardship responsibility about this country. 
You know, I must have tell, told my son Ted a couple of dozen times. You know, Ted, when I fled from Cuba, fled from oppression, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? There is no place to go. This is it. And unfortunately, too many of us have become too passive about it. But you know, you think about it. You know, most people think that the American Revolution started in the 1770s. But that's not true. The American Revolution really started in the 1730s with preachers like George Whitfield, like Jonathan Edwards, like Harry Hoosier. Do you know who Harry Hoosier was? The most prolific soul winner in America, a black preacher from Indiana. Why do you think the, the uh, motto in Indiana is Hoosiers? It came from Harry Hoosier. This black preacher was the, the biggest soul winner in the 1700s. But that's been erased from our history books. The revolution was made in the churches. In the churches. You look at the Declaration of Independence. I count 26 grievances against King George in the Declaration of Independence. Did you know that each and every one of those grievances were preached from the pulpits of America for 10 years prior to Jefferson writing them in the Declaration? Preachers from the pulpit calling out King George for the atrocities that the British were perpetrating upon the colonies. Now the question is, where are those pastors today? Most of them are hiding behind their pulpits, scared to death of not being politically correct. Well, it's about time we become biblically correct instead of politically correct. As a matter of fact, let me just give you a little glimpse of, of these. You heard of Paul Revere, right? British are coming, British are coming. First thing, did you know there was a black patriot riding with Paul Revere? His name was Wentworth Cheswell. As a matter of fact, Wentworth Cheswell was the first African American to hold public office in America, and he held nine different positions in public office in the 1700s. Did you also know that Paul Revere was going somewhere? He was going to the home of a pastor, a pastor by the name of Jonas Clark. As a matter of fact, at that home were two patriots hiding, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. They were the two most wanted men by the British Army. They had orders to capture them and hang them for sedition. First battle for our independence, Battle of Lexington, was fought right outside the church of Pastor Jonas Clark. Now here's something interesting. In the Battle of Lexington, eight colonies died. Seven of those eight were members of Pastor Jonas Clark's church. Why? Because the pastor and all the men of the congregation were at the forefront of that battle. Second battle for our independence, Battle of Concord, fought right outside the Church of Concord. And then the British began retreating northward towards Boston. And you hear that the militias were coming to the road and shooting at the British and killed about 600 British on that road. But what history doesn't tell you, because it's been a race, is that those militias were primarily composed of pastors and their congregations. The question again, where are those pastors today? You see, we got too many pastors that are just tickling men's ears inside the four walls. While the whole country is going to hell in a handbasket out there. We need to take the church out there. Yes. Instead of just praying church inside the four walls. 
But let me tell you about my favorite pastor. My favorite pastor is a man by John, by the name of John Peter Muhlenberg, Lutheran pastor in Woodstock, Virginia. Pastor Peter Muhlenberg was one of many pastors that the British greatly feared. They called them the Black Robe Regiment because all these pastors wore long black robes. Well, Pastor Muhlenberg is preaching at his church in Woodstock, Virginia, in early 1776. And he's preaching on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He concludes his message with verse 8 that says, there's a time for war and a time for peace. And just picture this. This pastor pulls a musket from behind the pulpit. And he says, this is a time for war. He unbuttons his black robe, and as he opens it, it uncovers his colonel's uniform in the Continental Army. And he looks at his congregation, and he says, how many of you men will follow me to go fight for our independence? 300 men that morning joined Pastor Colonel John Peter Muhlenberg to go fight for our independence. Meanwhile, Peter had a brother. Frederick Muhlenberg, also a pastor in New York City. And Frederick is writing letters. This is before the time of telephones or email or Twitter or text. So he's writing letters to Peter. You are prostituting the gospel. Separation of church and state. You shouldn't be involved in politics until the British burn Frederick's church. And then he said, well, maybe I better get involved. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is Frederick was the first speaker of the house. And Peter was also a congressman on that first congress. And the two of them were pivotal in the passing of the First Amendment, which gives us our religious freedom, our freedom of speech, our freedom of assembly, our freedom of the press. All of that came primarily out of those two men, pastors. I'll tell you, we need to realize, you know, the framers are being so maligned. You hear, oh, the framers were a bunch of secularists. They were deists. But nothing could be further from the truth. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration, 29 of them, over half, were seminary graduates. They were theologians. They were pastors. They were people of God. And I'll tell you, you think about it. Probably the one that people say was the least godly of them all. Two of them that they say they were the ungodly preachers, the, the ungodly framers. You know who they are? Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Let me tell you about those two men. First, Thomas Jefferson. In the third year of Jefferson's vice presidency. Jefferson, as president of the Senate, signed an order authorizing church services to take place in the rotunda of the Capitol, what today is called Statuary Hall. And church services were conducted in the rotunda of the Capitol every Sunday for 65 years, with as many as 2,000 people in attendance. So much for separation of church and state. As a matter of fact, Jefferson rode his horse every Sunday while he was vice president. And the eight years he was president, he rode his horse every Sunday from the White House to the Capitol to attend those services. They only stopped because after 65 years, some of these churches began building their own buildings. But you know something? Church services started again at the, at the Capitol four years ago. There are church services in the Capitol every Wednesday for the staff of the congressmen and senators and, and for them. And at the beginning of this year, about six months ago, church services started on Sunday in the Capitol for the Capitol Police, who are the only people there on Sunday. So I'll tell you, we need to realize that the challenge we have is that we have 
to realize that freedom, we enjoy a freedom in America that most of the world does not have. You know, at the time of the American Revolution, there was another revolution taking place at the same time. It was the French Revolution. The American Revolution gave us freedom, gave us a free enterprise system, and the most prosperous country on the face of the earth. The motto of the American Revolution was liberty. The motto of the French Revolution was equality. And what they mean by equality is what all these progressives mean about equality. Equality of outcome. Equality of outcome has never worked. Because if you work twice as hard, you deserve twice as much. As I said, the American Revolution gave us freedom, gave us a free enterprise system, gave us the most prosperous country in the world. The French Revolution gave them the guillotine and socialism. And France is a third world country today. Practically bankrupt. I'll tell you, we need to realize why America is so great. You know, my, my son puts it this way. Go down to South Florida. You never see a raft going to Cuba. They're all coming this way. I mean, you know, we got all this problem in the border. Do you see people trying to get into Mexico? No, they're all trying to come this way. Why? Because of the greatness of America. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville, he came to America right after the revolution. And he said, I sought for the greatness of America in his commodious harbors, and in her ample rivers, and in his vast mountains, and in his vast world commerce, and in his matchless constitution, and it was not there. It was only when I went into the churches of America and saw their pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of its genius and power. Listen to the next statement. This st statement is extremely important. He said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. That's where we are right now. I'm going to repeat it again. You need to memorize this. He said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Let me tell you, we have a responsibility as American citizens. In most of the countries in the world, people can't vote. Most of the world is ruled by dictators and kings. And voting is not just a privilege. It is a responsibility. Proverbs 29.2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bears rule, people mourn. But if the righteous, the people of principle, the people that follow the book, if those people are not voting, if those people are not even running for office, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked. The people without principle electing people without principle. Look at all the garbage that's going on in our schools. Why is that? Let me tell you why. Because Christians are not running for school board. Why do we have all the problems at the state and national level. Because Christians are not running for public office. Because too many Christians have said, politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of that. Have you heard that? I'm not going to ask you if you said it. Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of that. And you wash your hands like Pontius Pilate. And again, I remind you of Proverbs 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bears rule, people mourn. We have a responsibility before God. And let me tell you, we need to realize we are not a democracy. 
Don't be fooled. Democracy does not work. Democracy is mob rule. Democracy is the rule of the majority. Under a democracy, the minority has no rights. Let me give you a good example, Rwanda. In Rwanda, the Hutsis and the Tutsis, the Hutsis and the Tutsis, the 80% killed the 20%. Over a million people were killed. That's a democracy. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional representative republic where the right of the individual is protected. Every individual is protected under the constitution. That's a, constitu a constitutional representative republic. Now, we vote in a democratic manner. In, in other words, we elect by majority vote, but the minority is protected as much as the majority. Only in America. Only in America. And I'll tell you what. We need to look at what the Bible tells us about how to vote, who to vote for. Did you know the Bible tells you exactly who to vote for? Let me put it in context. Moses has just crossed the Red Sea. Now Moses is in the wilderness trying to govern about 2 million people. The Bible says 600,000 men plus women and children, so at least 2 million, maybe more. And Moses is going bananas. Here comes his father-in-law, Jethro. And in Exodus 18, he says, Moses, what you're doing is not God, not good. And God speaks to Moses through Jethro, and in Exodus 18, 21, God says to Moses, you select from among the people. Now that word select in the Hebrew is the same word for elect. You elect from among the people. And then he gives four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Let me repeat it for this side. Four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. That's how you vet every candidate. Now let's take him one at a time. Able men and women, of course. What does that mean? That simply means elect men and women who are capable of doing the job. Number two, such as fear God. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is a divine attribute, it comes from God. You can get knowledge from books, you don't get wisdom from books. Wisdom comes from God. We need to elect men and women that stand on the principles that have made America the greatest country on the face of the earth, and those are the principles of the Word of God. Let me tell you, if you look at the Constitution of the United States of America, there is a reason why our Constitution has lasted over two centuries, where the average Constitution around the world lasts only 17 years. And that is because the framers were on their knees seeking revelation from God. And revelation is what they got. I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the Constitution of the United States is a divinely inspired document because it was revelation from God. The Constitution uses two sources. Number one is the Bible. Number two is Blackstone's Dictionary of Law, which uses the Bible for everything. Blackstone's Dictionary of Law is a very interesting book because the definition of words they give you are the biblical definition for those words. Let me give you an idea. Why do you think we have three branches of government? Isaiah 33, 22. God says, I'm your king, I'm your judge, I'm your lawgiver. They're the three branches of government. I'll tell you a minute, in a minute why we are a limited government, why we are a republic and not a democracy. 
Why are churches tax exempt? Not because of the IRS, because of Ezra 7.24, which says priests and Levites and workers of the temple are free from taxes and excise. Comes right out of the word of God. Now, able men, such as fear God. Number three, men of truth. This is a big one. How many of us have come across candidates for public office that will tell you all these wonderful things they're going to do? Only to get elected and do exactly the opposite. Anybody here? I mean, we've all experienced that. But you know something? Jesus tells us the solution for that. Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruits. So don't listen to what they say, because you know something? Politicians are going to tell you what they think you want to hear. They're going to tickle your ears. So just tell them, don't tell me, show me. Amen. Show me your scars. When have you fought to protect life? From conception to natural death. When have you fought to protect our right to keep and bear arms? When have you fought to protect our right to low taxes and to keep the money in our pocket instead of having the government steal it from both hands from our pockets? Amen. Show me. Come on. Okay, able men, such as fear God, men of truth. Number four, hating covetousness. Covetousness, greed, is a very interesting thing in politics. It's not primarily about money. It is about power and control. Politicians covet power, and they covet the control that that gives them over we the people. That's we have, why we have politicians all over the country. We've got a couple in California that have been in Washington for many, many years, and they don't want to leave. They love that power. And they love that control that power gives them. Lord Acton said once, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So now you know how to vet a candidate for qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Exodus 18, 21 continues. And set them up as rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. So the model you see is Moses, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. That's equivalent to federal government, state government, county government, local government. Verse 22. And only take up to Moses, that is to the federal government, matters of great importance. Everything else you handle yourself at the local level, at the state level. That is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That's called the Enumerated Powers of Congress. 18 powers described in Article 1, Section 8. If it ain't there, federal government's got no business being involved in it. Let me give you a couple of examples. The word education. Nowhere in Article 1, Section 8. Let me ask you a question. Does it make sense? to have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., deciding how to educate our children and grandchildren. No, 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 no. That decision needs to be at the local level with parents, teachers, and a local school board. Let me tell you another word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. The word marriage or the word family. You see, that decision on marriage that the Supreme Court made almost three years ago they had no jurisdiction. And another thing I want to tell you, according to Article 3 of the Constitution, and if you don't know the Constitution, you need to read it. According to Article 3 of the Constitution, judges and justices have no authority whatsoever to make law. All they can do is render opinions. Opinions. So it's not the law of the land. It is an opinion. Only Congress can make law. And only the president can sign a law into being. Judicial branch only renders opinions. But Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. 
I'll tell you, we need to realize that we got a responsibility before God. Because I'll tell you what happened in Nazi Germany. In Nazi Germany, what happened, happened because most of the church totally became passive. As a matter of fact, it is said that in churches that were close to the railroad tracks, when the trains were coming by filled with Jews going to the, to the incinerators, when the churches were hearing the cries of those Jews in those trains, they just sang louder, played the music louder to kind of opaque the cries of those that were going to their death trap. But let me tell you about two pastors in Nazi Germany. The first one was called Martin E. Mueller. Martin E. Mueller was a Lutheran pastor like most of the pastors in Germany. He, uh, he said, first they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Finally, they came for me. And there was no one left to speak on my behalf. Pastor Niemuller was arrested. He was thrown into a holding tank with a bunch of drunks. The next morning, a Lutheran chaplain dressed just like Niemuller. Lutheran pastors at that time dressed all in black with a pastoral collar. They still do it today. And so this chaplain walks into that jail and looks at that cell, and there's a guy in there dressed just like him. So this chaplain says to this pastor, Pastor, why are you there, my brother? Nimuller stands up and said, my dear brother, consider what is happening in our country. Why are you not in here with me? It is a time that we have to stop being passive. There's another pastor in Nazi Germany. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Pastor Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. And then he said, God will not hold us guiltless. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Our silence speaks very loudly. And I think the most sobering statement he made is, God will not hold us guiltless. We have a responsibility. Jesus said, shout it from the housetops. We have a responsibility to be a voice for righteousness. I repeat to you Proverbs 29 two. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bears rule, people mourn. We have a responsibility before God to be light and salt to a world that is going to hell in a handbasket. We got the truth. Yes. We got the truth. And Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Well, don't put a bucket over that light. Go take that light out there and go shake up people and wake them up. Because too many people across America are in a stupor and they're being brainwashed by secular humanism, which is the biggest and the most fast, the fastest growing religion in America. The religion of self. That's what's being promoted in the universities. You're your own God. Do your own thing. And I'll tell you what. Jesus Christ needs to be exalted above all in America. Because righteousness exalts as a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. We need to exalt the word of God. Exalt Jesus Christ. And realize that America is 
without exception, the greatest country on the face of the earth. I wish I had the money for everyone that hates America to buy my one-way ticket. <laughs> because I'll tell you, I've seen the other side, and it ain't pretty. I know what it is to live without freedom. And I'll tell you what, I will die fighting before I see America go the same way. And so should you. Because truly what I said to my son is true. If we lose our freedoms here, there's no place to go. There is no place to go. But too many of us have taken it for granted. But you know our freedoms are being eroded more and more and more every day. Here in California, there is a bill before the assembly right now to ban the sale of all Bibles. You didn't know that? It's in the assembly right now. It hasn't passed, but it's in the assembly. Ban, and you know what the politicians say? Oh, we're not going to take your Bibles from your home. You just can't buy any new, any new Bibles. Seriously? It's in the assembly right now. Why? Because Christians are silent. I encourage you. Write letters to your assemblyman or assemblywoman. Write letters to your senators. Write letters to your government, to the governor. Write letters to your U.S. congressmen and to U.S. senators. Flood them with emails and phone calls. Shut down their lines with phone calls. Make them listen. Because I'll tell you a secret that politicians won't tell you. Politicians want you to think that you work for them. But in reality, they work for you. You are their bosses. And you know how you have power over them. You can throw them out of office with your vote. But that doesn't happen if you don't vote. We got to exercise our responsibilities. America is still one nation under God. And God needs to be exalted. I'll tell you. I don't know about you. I have one goal in life. Which far exceeds any other goal. And that is to one day hear my Savior say. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Amen. Anything else is insignificant. You know, I'm going to leave you with a verse of scripture found in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. Jesus came to set us free, not to be in bondage. One of my favorite movies is the movie Braveheart. Remember the last word of William Wallace in Braveheart? Freedom! Jesus came to set men free. And we need to fight for freedom in America. But I'll tell you more than that. Jesus came to set individuals free. Free from the bondage and the guilt of sin. Free from bondage to addiction. An addiction could be to drugs, could be to alcohol, like in my case. I was a drunk before I came to Christ. At least one brewery kept running because of me. <laughs> addiction could be an addiction to gossiping. An addiction to anger, which you can't control or to criticism, to a critical spirit, or to depression, which really when you come right down to it, the root cause of depression is not trusting God. But I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ wants to set you free. Amen. You know, it's very, very interesting. There's a verse in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 16, where Jesus said, I have you engraved in the palms of my hands. 
And I can visualize Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, looking at those holes in his hands and saying, Greg, I did this for you. Bro, I did this for you. Make, I did this for you. I have you engraved in the palm of my hands. Jesus went to the cross because of love. He loved you and I so much that he knew that if we got what we deserve, every one of us would spend an eternity in hell. We would fry in hell, every one of us. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, not one. But he loved us so much that it's like if you were in a court of law and you're being accused of murder and you know you're guilty. And the judge says you're guilty and the penalty is death. And all of a sudden somebody stands up and says, Judge, he doesn't have to die. I'll die in his place. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came to this earth as all God and all man lived a perfect sinless life. So he didn't have to pay for himself. And he went to the cross to pay for that penalty of sin for you and I. So we can not only spend an eternity in God's presence, but so we could live a victorious life here on earth. Because Jesus said, when you accept him, he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll be with you always to the end of the age. And he gives you guide. He gives you strength. He gives you peace in the midst of the storm. Not only peace when everything is going peachy, peace when everything is falling apart. Because he's greater than all the circumstances. Amen. I want to invite you. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not asking if you go to church or if you've been in church all your life. I'm not asking if you know about Jesus. I'm asking if you have a personal relationship with you, with him. I'm asking if you know for a fact that if you die this instant, you will be in his presence. Everybody with their eyes closed, please. If you don't know that this is true, if you have no total assurance that if you died right now, you'll be in the presence of God. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Nobody's looking. Please raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else that you say, I don't know for a fact if I die today, I will be in heaven. Thank you for that hand. I'm going to say a prayer. Put your hands down. I want to say a prayer, and I want all of us to repeat the, this prayer in a loud voice, all together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I, thank you I thank you that you love me, so much, that you love me so, much. That you so much, that you went to the cross on my behalf. And on the cross, you took all my sins upon yourself. And God the Father judged my sins in the body of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the proof that the payment was enough was that God raised you from the dead on the third day. I now, Lord Jesus, Receive that payment on my behalf. And I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, on the authority of the Word of God, if you pray that prayer, Jesus Christ has come to take residence in your heart. And the Bible says you have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And he will walk with you. He will guide you. He will give you direction. 
and he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Let me tell you, before I came to Christ, and I was 36 years old when I prayed that prayer and <laughs> surrendered to him. Before that, I was a drunk. Before that, my life was in total turmoil. And it just turned my life around. And it just gave me a peace in spite of circumstances. And it gave me a direction of life. And it gave me a fullness of life that I could never experience. Money can't buy it. It's only that personal relationship. And he said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I want to just commend those of you who prayed that prayer today. And I just say, Jesus is with you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. God bless California. Thank you. To God be the glory.